Okay, Yele Ferinha uh, is currently uh, writing his PhD thesis titled Design by Simulation. Uh, he's exploring the potential of simulation for architectural conception at the Hyperbody Research Group at TU Delft. Jele has taught and lectured at uh, ESA at Paris Malaquais, ETH, TU Delft, and Aru School of Architecture. He's the founding partner in Easy City Architecture and Design Research, together with Philippe Morel. Um, the work of uh, Easy City is part of the permanent collection at the Pompidou Center uh, in Paris, and also part of the Frac Orléans collection. In 2007, the office won the Sirius Cerusi Pavilion, uh, and their projects have been exhibited all over the place, uh, including Mori Art Museum in Tokyo, Archilab in Orléans, the Barbican Gallery in London, the Design Miami Basel in Miami, the Pompidou Center, the Maison Rouge, Architectural Association, and many more. Um, Yele's thesis focuses on the close coupling of advanced simulation methods with evolutionary computing methods. Early research results have been exhibited at uh, the Transnatural in Amsterdam and also at the Club Transmediale exhibition in Berlin. At the Hyperbody Group, uh, Yele has been exploring, exploring novel CNC fabrication methods for the production of large volumetric elements by means of hot wire cutting. Currently, Yele is uh, working on setting up a robotics lab to further continue this angle of research. For his research work, uh, Yele relies on open source software. Working together with Tomas Paviot, Yele has been driving the development of an open source CAD framework, uh, Python, that I think that some of you know, uh, CAD, uh, CAD Kai PLM development framework for the Python programming language. Um, anyway, I think that uh, we will be amazed by some of the things that uh, Yele is actually working on. Uh, we will soon have a robot, a KUKA robot here at IAC. Uh, is, is actually arriving, I think, something like in three weeks. So I hope that we will be able to tempt you to come back and do something with us. Oh, yes, please. <laughs> oh. So, so, Marta, thanks for that second uh, invitation and, and thank you. Sorry. Do you have to be a bit closer? Uh, sure, yeah, I can do that. So, so thank you for the for the warm uh, warm welcome today. And Luis, thank you for for showing me uh, around the school. And thanks to the students for evocating your uh, yeah your wonderful and interesting ideas uh, today. Um, I've been intrigued by the work of 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 uh, the IASA and and. For, for a while now. Um, I particularly re remember the, the, the conference we had uh, in, 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 the, in spring. And a number of, of topics you, you touched upon, I, I hope to sort of factored in into this, uh, in, into this lecture, which, which, has been, uh, which has been particularly inspiring. So many thanks for that. My lecture is uh, titled The Promotion of the Architectural Model. And it consists of, uh, of three parts. So there's a, there's a more formal theoretical part. Then I'll introduce you to, to some of the some of the the, the projects, and uh, I will finish by a, by a projection, if you will. So perhaps some of you are are familiar with Lewis Carroll endlessly unfurling saga Sylvie and Bruno. At some point, uh, a quirky little man by the name of Meinherr regales the children with a story about life on this mysterious home planet. The story con continues as follows. And then came the grandest idea of all. We actually made a map of the country on the scale of a mile to the mile. Have you ever used it much? I inquired. It has never been spread out yet, said Meinheir. The farmers objected. They said it would cover the whole country and shut out the sunlight. So we now use the country itself as its own map, and I assure you, it just it does nearly as well. So perhaps the grand map provides us an analogy of what is currently unfolding in architecture. That is, the model has lost its abstraction. Of course, we we use the the grand map on a on a on a daily basis. So I I, I hope it sort of gives you 
provide you an analogy of the of the current situation um, where architecture is, is is moving towards. So this transgression of the model from a symbolic description to a platonic original is making a dramatic impact on the practice autonomy, economy, uh, and, and economy of architecture. The digital model has been catalyst in expanding the scope of architectural form. Though little has been said on the dramatic epistemological shift of the model, so this lecture tries to index some of the origins and consequences of this loss of abstraction, which sort of the grand map is an indication of. So in this graph you see some of the aspects that I will try to, to introduce, divided in three domains. Epistemology, the, the, the philosophy of science, if you will, robotics and computation. In his, architect, art, in his article, Finite Nature, physicist Ed Fredkin states a radical, provoking idea. What cannot be programmed cannot be physics. If a process cannot be programmed on a particular universal computer, computer despite having enough memory and time, then it can't be programmed on any computer. A computer is a universal device. If we can't program it on an ordinary computer, finite nature implies it can't be part of physics because physics runs on a kind of computer. So I'm wondering if, whether there's an architectural analogy of this statement. However literal the interpretation, what cannot be programmed, cannot be built, might be, that statement is increasingly win winning in relevance, given that both the conception and manufacturing of architecture increasingly runs on a kind of computer. The forefront of architecture has become a computational universe. Therefore, it's worthwhile to examine if Fredkin's theory of computing and physics can be interpreted in an architecturally meaningful manner. However true even the oversimplistic appropriation of Fredkin's theory might be, it, it doesn't do justice to its, to its depth. So my, my understanding of Fredkin's notion relates to the transmutation of the, of the architectural model. So what cannot be programmed, cannot be physics, constitutes a, re a relation among the laws of physics an object is subjected to, uh, the, the object's programming, if you will, and its physical manifestation. Therefore, if we can accept both architecture's computational turn and Fredkin's statement, the question surfaces whether Fredkin's notion can be sub subjected to this architectural interpretation. So, here's an example. This is a, a bit bacterial portraiture. It's a it's a it's a slab seated with an um, engineered E. coli that was projected to an image of Charles Darwin. So, bacteria in in dark regions of the image uh, express an enzyme which produces a black pigment. So the gene expression of the E. coli bacteria has been hacked and this enzyme has been introduced, if you will. Uh, and this results in a positive print of the applied portraiture. So this is research by Jeff Tarber uh, of, uh, of Rice University. And I think this image illustrates that, illustrates this idea of finite nature. What cannot be programmed cannot be, be physics quite, quite accurately. And what I'm fascinated with is that the constitution, the, the, the bacteria's formation or composition denotes its meaning. So meaning can be expressed by connotation. Let's say if you, if you uh, make a bird out of clay, the, associ the association to a bird is uh, comes across by, a, by connotation, right? It reminds us of a bird. But let's say a real bird denotes, denotates the being of a real bird, right? It, 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 it's literally what it is. And perhaps to a certain degree we see that also in, 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 in this image. So in nature, 
and that's, that's what this gene expression hack underscores, is that there's no interpretation here. Things are what they, what they are. And why I think this, this is a, a relevant point is that for most architect nature is something that provides an analogy, right? So, but, but from an epistemological point of view, this, this cold caricature of, of biomimicry can be sometimes somewhat perverse. So, I mean, this by, if, if nature's mechanisms are that well understood, why do we settle for simile? Although there have been dramatic insights in how nature functions, many architects and evil, even our, our compute, uh, even contemporary computational architects operate no different then, for instance, uh, Berlach, who was inspired by Hegel's Kunstformen der, der Natur. So this is remarkable since computing, uh, since a compu contemporary understanding of nature is uh, that computing is, if you will, nature's runtime as a Fredkin statement. So my point is that if computation is conceptually so close to nature, why do we use it to, to, to mimic nature rather than become, become a part of it? So maybe I'm an extremist, I don't know. Um, so the architectural model has become literal. With, with architecture's computational turn, the model changed in terms of both modality and denotation. The, mo the model has become the absolute project reference where it is used, where it used to be a, a declaration of architectural intent, merely a metaphor for the project to build. That is to say, the, the architectural model has been promoted. The transgression of a, the model from a symbolic description to a definition has made a, a, a dramatic impact on, on practice, autonomy and economy of architecture. The first project where the promotion of the model became manifest uh, is here in Barcelona. It's, it's, it's Gary's uh, uh, fish, fish sculpture, fish folly. And what, what was remarkable about the project is that it, it was delivered a couple of uh, weeks before the deadline. And if I remember correctly, it was uh, built for around 90% of the budget, while, while the, the project itself is, as you see, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's a challenging build. However, what is certain is that the project is not a fish. So although the model has become literal, its meaning remains figurative. It's a, it's a representation of a fish. And sometimes that, that can be, I think that can be quite a problem. So what the virtuosity of design to production's post-rationalization underscores is that this roof is not a straw hat, being the metaphor on, on, on which Shigeru Ban uh, based his roof design on. So that wouldn't be an issue if it, if it was built like then. Even it might be a, a, a legitimate position if the architect's design achieved a, a, a level of suspension of disbelief, in the sense that if we would have believed uh, that it's a straw hat. So the roof was modeled in an oversimplistic way. And, and this, this image sort of demonstrates that a hexagonal pattern is projected from the ground plane and hence bears no relation uh, regarding how, how the roof works structurally, for instance, which can be observed by the homogeneous thickness uh, of the columns spread throughout the roof. You see the. The, the wooden slats are as thick at, 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 the, at the base of the column as they are uh, at, the, at, the, uh, at the rest of the at the, at the, at the rest of the roof. So the, the, it bears no relation to, to its structural load, for instance. What's, what's striking is that, let's say, the rigor demonstrated in, in the project realization is, in, in my belief, in stark uh, contrast with the precision in terms of its architectural conception. So where the model has become literal in fabrication, it remains allegorical in terms of its architectural conception. 
right here we, here we see this projection of the hexagonal grid so where the Metcentre Pompidou project struggles with uh, if you if you will an analogical discrepancy the, the recently completed uh, Qatar National Convention Center of Isozaki deals with a with a functional uh, discrepancy so the shape of the building or rather its structure is the result of a topological optimization process with the objective of minimizing the volume required to distribute the, the loads on the roof now the irony here is that there is little load to distribute although the base suggests a skyscraper um, so the issue here is not the optimization process per se, but, but I would say rather it's naive architectural application. So Markos Novik, for instance, defines, defines elegance as the, the achievement of maximum effect with minimal effort, as sort of an aesthetic appropriation of, of optimization, if you will. So from, from, from that point of view, the, the this building is 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 almost uh, it, it's it's something of an uh, obscene uh, building, almost uh, pornographic. So rather than uh, that, the optimization achieved a level of elegance. It it produced a structure that that overdosed on Viagra. Um, right? It's it's sort of an architectural impotence, uh, if you if you will. So. You know the, these projects suffer, 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 fr suffer from this effect, right? It looks like a boat, but we can all agree that it that it isn't uh, a boat. So the model is dissolved in in sort of the architectural modus operandi in the in the project of uh, Fabio and Grammatio. The assembled bricks simultaneous, simultaneously are the ar architectural model as well as its architectural manifestation. So a representation of the, the robot, robotic assembly process would be pretty, pretty meaningless, right? Uh, therefore, if CNC-based building methodologies are to, to be embraced, so has the promotion of the, of the model has to be internalized in, in the conception of architecture. So it's precisely this embedding of architectural knowledge that that offers such uh, uh, that offers vast potential, and I'm really interested in this stage where, let's say, the the architectural model becomes operative. So perhaps this this project by Joris Larman, although it's quite beautiful, it it. Act, it achieves the exact opposite, where where the, uh, the objective is trying to to recreate uh, a model. So you wonder what what does all this complexity leads to? I, I I think in the the case of of this table, it is a complicated table, not a not a complex table. So, in a sense, theory, you know, you could almost argue that super studios. A uh, simple table is conceptually more complex than the complicated table of, of Joris Larman. So that makes you wonder, right? And as, as imposing and quite beautiful as I find this, this project, I find it also a little bit daft in the sense that uh, the conceptual precision is is again in contrast with let's say the rigor and precision in terms of of manufacturing so there's all this resolution of these particle elements but let's say this is this is not a simulation right or um, these these balls would never <laughs> propagate through space in this way so it's it's a very ambivalent image if you if you will so what I, what I find interesting in, in evolutionary computing is that um, it allows you to to 
arrive at designs that are beyond your, uh, uh, certainly mine, intellectual capacity, right? So, if you think of, of simulation, if you have a, let's say you have a, a, a simulation software on your computer, fine, right, a binary, and a lot of, a lot of knowledge has been condensed in this software. So, if you apply a model to this software, you, you can think of a simulation as, as latent knowledge, right? If I apply a model to this simulation model, I know more about it. So evolutionary computing is also a method that allow you to condense the latent knowledge of simulation into a, into a model, right? So you start, we start in a sense with a, um, is this running? So we start with a with a random population of, of chairs that are located in a, let's say, a design domain. And for each generation, there there is a buildup of evolutionary pressure, right? So each chair has to be an Im improvement of, of the previous generation, otherwise it's not propagated to to a next generation, right? So evolutionary pressure is being built up, if you will. But the interesting thing uh, about this design approach is that it's, it rids design of common assumptions and abstractions, so, so common, commonly used in, in engineering. So this is an uh, overview of, of all the chairs we've, we've come up with. It took about uh, six weeks to, to compute all these, these chairs on the grip computing uh, facilities of the, of the INRIA. So, for instance, to, to evolve this chair, uh, about 600,000 uh, uh, chairs um, give way to this this finalized version. So we're also interested in, let's say, the, the computational potential of raw, uh, raw massive uh, computational power. Um, the other thing is that, and this is something I will try to elaborate on uh, later, later in the lecture, is that to, to fabricate these chairs, it's not so difficult, right? It's just uh, a bunch of contours that you, that you cut by a water jet. So in industrially, it's not such a challenge to, to make, to, to produce difference, right? There's, no, uh, there's little uh, industrial challenge in producing thousands and thousands of, of different chairs. So the question becomes, how do you create meaningful instantiations of a design concept, right? So this, is, this has been uh, uh, something we've, uh, an idea we've been, been trying to, to explore. So, for instance, uh, this week there was this, this project on display uh, at the university where I work, in, in the TU Delft. And, you know, students have been slaving over, over the assemblies of these Lego bricks, right? And it's, to me it represents uh, a pure contradiction, right? You cannot be a creationist believing in evolution, right? Either you believe in evolution or you believe in God. It's you know you you have to <laughs> you have to choose one side or the other side. It's like you cannot be a pro-life porn star, right? It would be it would be a, a bit funky to to do that. Uh, so I was a, yeah I find it a little bit upsetting. It tries to be both creationist and evolutionary uh, at the, at the same time, and evolution to me is a mechanism, not a, not a metaphor, right? So, heavily upset. <laughs> um, so, this is a, uh, let me try to introduce you to another project, that of the uh, Cirrusi Pavilion. So, Madame Cirrusi is a well-known art collector that living at the former estate of André Bloch, perhaps familiar to you as the founder of uh, Architecture d'Aujourd'hui. At this estate, he built several of these habitacles, so those are sculpture for living with, not, not, not living in, if you will. The idea of the, of the pavilion uh, was to evolve a gallery such that throughout the whole year, throughout the whole day, 
the pavilion would be lit by uh, approximately 200 lux di uh, daylight. So at some point, designing with light is one of the most banal things you could do, right? If a student comes to me, yeah, I got a great idea. I'm going to design with light. You know, it's, 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 it's a terrible cliche. But let's say if you, if you master tools of, of simulation, you can kick in open doors because you, you can approach the problem with, with a new level of precision. So John Mardelievich, who is who's an uh, authority in terms of, of, of daylight simulation, built up uh, a, a sky sun model for me that is based on satellite climate data. So it's an incredibly accurate local uh, model of the, of the, of the climate. Uh, it is also a cumulative model. So it's not, let's say, just one moment in the year. It, it's a model of a whole year. Uh, so this incredibly detailed model made it possible to evolve, uh, to, to develop this concept, right? You cannot do this concept if you, if you don't have a, 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 an, an accurate simulation uh, method. So what, what, what I find interesting in, in working with evolution is evolutionary computing is that it's sort of an amplifier of your of your architectural ID, right? Uh, for instance, Theo van Doesburg said that he was interested in the mere consequences of a simple ID. So the, the ID for this, this pavilion is brutally simple at some point, right? But evolution allows you to uh, go to the mere consequences of this, of this ID. I think in the end we, we won for a different reason is that we shoved a lot of the program uh, in the, in sort of, um, uh, uh, we shoved it underground. <coughs> sort of you access the, the site by ascension and so you enter actually here in the, in the lower right corner. So probably won, we, we didn't won by, by this fancy computational aspect by good old fashioned architectural thinking. <laughs> Um, so, for instance, if you ask a, a, a classic engineer to 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 do uh, a lighting simulation, he will use this probably use the 1906 uh, CIE standard, which is a, a, a hemisphere dome of 200 lux. So it doesn't matter if your project if is in Rotterdam, Dubai, or on the North Pole. It's this. <laughs> it's a an incredibly coarse abstraction of the actual conditions. So what, 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 I'm, what I'm sort of proud of in this project is, let's say, uh, in contrast into, to, the, to, the, to the chair, which you can understand that was designed by a generative or computational process, is that sort of the, 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 sol the method is really dissolved here into, in the architecture. So the method is sort of uh, not evident in the, in, the, in the resulting design, but in that sense, a bit more uh, subtle. That is a beautiful quote, this, this quote of John Holland. Evolutionary computing is the mechanization of the scientific method. So, You know, as, as, as all architects experience, it turns out that our dedication was greater than uh, that of our, our client, and we didn't get to build this pavilion. Pretty frustrating. So I tried to think of um, a way to, let's say, sublimate the, the idea of the, of the, of the pavilion in, in something else. And of course, I was sitting on all these tons of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, posi solar, solar positions, this, this very accurate model. So what I try to, to, to think of is that whether I could, would be able to come up with, a, with an object that would cast a circular shadow throughout the whole year, throughout the whole day. So, you know, in architecture we, we are, we are, we're getting pretty used to complexity and or, or complicated things. Um, 
So the, 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 the question that I try to reflect on is that what, is, what really is complexity, right? Is it difficult, complicated geometry? Or is it con condensing knowledge into an apparently simple model? Okay, for you, for you to decide what, uh, <laughs> what works. So, uh, what's sort of fun about this, this, the, this project is that, you know, uh, maybe it shares some of the, the aspects of, the, uh, of, this, of this, uh, this work, the Mysterium Cosmographicum of, of uh, Johannes Kepler. Um, he, he thought he, he figured out a model to describe the universe, right? So by nesting platonic solids, he thought he, thought he found a way to describe the architecture of the universe. And that made him a religious man in the sense that if this is true, the universe is perfect, the universe is created by God, right? His mom was, was burnt at the witch. Maybe, maybe this was also convincing. Um, and so, something, something interesting in, uh, in, in the Stonehenge is that although it's, it's a rationalist project, right? It's a, it's a, in a sense, it's a, the, the contemporary interpretation is that, it, that it's a calendar. But it's, it's both, let's say, a very rationalist and a mystical project. Uh, uh, myst uh, uh, there's this mystic aspect almost about it. And I'm, I'm quite fond of this, this duality, if you, if you will. So it, it reminded me of, of the sentences on conceptual art by, by Solowit. Conceptual art, artists are mysticists rather than rationalists. They leap to conclusions that logic cannot reach. So a good example, maybe, maybe a, a far better example than, than the work I've been showing you, is this antenna that has been evolved by, by Greg Hornby of the, of the NASA. So this is an antenna for a satellite. It consumes a lot of power, right? Because you have to, you, you'd like to still communicate with Earth and send signal to us. So, so you know, since, the, since space is uh, it's pretty much a vacuum, it doesn't take so much energy to drive forth. But sending, communicating takes, takes up a lot of power. And it's, you know, you're, you're, it's, it's a, it's a pretty, cool, pretty difficult uh, thing to design as well, because, you know, after the iPhone 4, everybody knows that it's a highly multi-dimensional problem. You know, your GPRS has to work, your GPS, your UMTS, your, your normal GMs, uh, GSM signal, all these different signals that, that are interfering like hell with each other have to have, to, have, to have decent reception. So, what I find so appealing about this antenna is that if you don't, if you are not aware of all these complexities and all these subtleties, it looks like somebody channeled their anger on a, on a, on a paper clip, right? Though if you are well aware of, of what it really means, it, it represents the absolute state of the art in technology. That's a, that's a fun duality, no? So yeah, there was a, a pretty good update on the, this this book cover by the uh, uh, of, of the mechanization takes command by by uh, Gideon. So <laughs> I really love that that they're able to change the cover from something purely mechanical to something that uh, suggests the state of the art in in computing. <laughs> it's sort of fun. So to to reiterate on this idea, right? This is uh, this is an, um, the result of a of a petascale simulation, a four trillion cell metal annealing simulation. And what it what it makes me think about is that the person who wrote the code of this computation of fluid dynamic solver, to what extent? How far did his mental image of the results of, of, of his algorithm, how accurate was his mental image of, let's say, the, the algorithms embedded in his solver, right? And I, I cannot imagine that you 
develop an understanding of these algorithms at this incredible detail, right? It, it takes months and months to compute at, at the, um, what is it, at the Blue Gene L supercomputer, uh, which is probably, I think, the, the largest supercomputer in the world. Um, so let's, let's say computing generates knowledge. That's, that's sort of what you can deduce from that. So there seems almost an, an, uh, an al alchemical component to, 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 to evolution or these uh, simulation processes. It's a process of transmutation, of optimization. It allows you to uh, achieve you know, results that lie beyond your intellectual capacity. It, it's a process of sublimation, of multiplication, of calcination, of conjunction. So uh, the idea of alchemy is that nature drives, it, it, nature drives toward perfection that bursts forth without the intervention of labor. What nature cannot perfect in a vast space of time, we can achieve in a short space of time by our art. That's, that's essentially what you are doing in evolutionary computing, right? It's compressing uh, uh, the process of, of e evolution. So this sounds really vague. Alchemy, alchemy binds uh, matter and spirit. I, I will try to uh, uh, precise that a little bit later on. Um, oh, double slide. Sorry about that. So this is um, a, a bridge evolved by uh, Pablo Funes, who's a, a student of uh, Jordan, uh, Jordan Pollack. And what's certain is that, you know, this, this bridge, it's, it tries to, to produce a, a Lego structure that, that, that goes as far from the table as, as capable, right? But what's striking is that, you know, this lies beyond, it's a, again an example of something that lies beyond uh, your own capacities, right? So, this, the, the students of Jordan Pollack are uh, Pablo Funes and the, the person I, I mentioned before, Greg Hornby of the, of the satellite, are, are, are some of the most brilliant people in this, uh, in, the, in this field. So these images are images of the Golem project and it's, it really is a, is a seminal project in the field of, of, of evolution. So remember I, I was saying that alchemy binds body and spirit, and the Golem project really embraced that ID. So it simultaneously evolved, let's say, the body of a robot with the brain, right? So, and it's also something that, that biologists believe in the sense that, let's say, if Marta and I were, would go to the hospital, yeah, and you would be so kind to, you know, self-improvement and uh, would get your head. It, it would take a quite a while for, let's say, I, I wouldn't be able to move probably, right? Because let's say our, our nervous system has been developed with our body, right? So there's the distinction between, let's say, between, uh, yeah, your, your, uh, your, uh, how can I say that? Your spirit and your body is, is quite interrelated. Um, so let me, let me try to... There's something really disappointing about evolutionary computing in the sense that it's a, it's a method for dealing with complexity, right? But the complexity that you can represent, the complexity that you in, can encode is in fact very, very limited. So the, the, the chairs project that I saw you is, that I showed you before is sort of what, what we've been sort of at the limits what, of what we were able to reach with traditional design encodings. So are you familiar with the distinction of a genotype and a phenotype? Let's say your body is the phenotype of your DNA, which is a genotype, right? So the genotype is the encoding of your 
of you, of your being. So a problem in evolutionary computing is that the genotype e is exactly equal to the phenotype, right? So here I have a binary matrix and evolutionary uh, evolution is, if you will, reduced to bit flipping. Either I, I switch uh, a voxel on or off, right? Though in nature things work very, very differently. So your, your brain is encoded by roughly 30,000 genes and it results in 100 billion cells, right? So these encodings are incredibly, incredibly compact. So here again are these, these uh, body-brain evolutions of, uh, of, of Jordan Pollack. And again, these are uh, the works of, of his students, uh, Greg Hornby, um, Pablo Funes. So we, we to get working together with Mark Chernow, who is one of the leading researchers in, in the field of evolutionary computing, we, we have been able to, to do somewhat better encodings, right? So a voxel you know, in two dimensions, in, um, it, it scales quadratically, but in three dimensions, it scales cubically, right? So y you need a huge amount of elements to, to encode a design pretty precisely. So at some, at some point, you need so many elements, and since there is no abstraction, no modularity in this encoding, it just becomes pure noise, right? And the evolutionary process gets completely stuck. Uh, so the Vorono encoding was, is so, uh, uh, does a little bit better, right? Since a cell can occupy a lot of volume or a tiny bit of it, right? So let's say during the evolutionary process, uh, you can say that the encoding sort of is self-optimizing because um, yeah, it will distribute points in a, in a reasonably effective manner. So it's not a solution, but you know, it's a little, a little bit better. So what is necessary to advance is to, is to, um, to compile the, gen the, the genotypic code into a phenotype, right? So there has to be a sort of mapping aspect between the genotype and, and uh, the phenotype. So it's not a one-to-one -one literal correspondence. Now it has to be interpreted, if you will. So there are, there are a number of, of reasons why these design schemas don't, don't scale well. So let's say the, 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 the evolution is encoded in a very direct manner. And so it's not like a construction plan, right? The construction plan is, is a more indirect encoding. So there's no compactness, there's no bias, there's no modularity, there's no embedding of domain uh, knowledge. So there are a couple of, um, let's say, aspects that are essential in order to make these encodings more scalable. So developmental de development is essential. So evolutionary computing is, is much modeled to a sort of 1950s understanding of, of, of um, evolutionary and a lot has happened since that time. So when we come to the world, we still have to evolve for about, develop for about 30 years because before you become somewhat useful to to architecture, right? Or that certainly was the case uh, for me. Um, and another difficult point is that in evolution, we only consider, let's say, fitness, how effective something is at a, at a global level. So either my building works, my chair works or not. I don't say anything about an element of my building, right? So there's too little propagation of all this information in the evolutionary process. So, so there are a, a, a number of, of uh, modes to, to overcome um, these limitations. So this is sort of a taxonomy of design representations by uh, Greg Hornby. Maybe this is a little bit technical now to, to to get into that, but there, there's 
one aspect I'd like to, to, to point out is that uh, modularity, of course, but parameterization is not a generative encoding, right? And it's, it's maybe interesting to quickly touch upon it because it's, it's such a, a common uh, uh, misperception, right? People think that if they do parametric design that they are doing generative design. Uh-uh. It's absolutely impossible, right? If you parameterize a triangle, you cannot go beyond the triangle, right? So let's say the generative capacity of your design is very, very limited. And this is also something that I find interesting about evolutionary computing is that there is no bias, right? So you're, you're um, not limiting the design process by your own assumptions. Um, so let me speed up a little bit and, and skip these slides. Um, so let's say the, the, the state of the art in evolutionary computing in, is inspired by synthetic biology, by molecular uh, biology, by developmental approaches, by amorphous computing, and um, so this is a sort of classic design representation, right? We have a genotypic space, we map this to the phenotypic space, we compute its, gl uh, its, its global fitness. So a more advanced way of doing this is from the genotypic space, a, the, let's say your, the DNA is being developed, right? Is it, it's exposed to uh, an environment, if you will, and this environmental feedback is, is necessary to, to arrive at, um, at more scalable representations, if you will. So what's, what's interesting about doing all this, all this sort of research is that you get quite fresh perspectives on really obvious ideas <laughs> uh, at some point. So much to my resentment, Actually, you, you get back to, to this idea of morphogenesis, which is sort of a, um, a word really uh, uh, often misused in, in arch arch uh, architecture, let's say, or misused, used in a, in a very metaphorical way. So what is, what is morphogenesis? It's, it's, in terms of evolutionary computing, I think of it as many levels of indirection. So a plan upon a plan upon a plan upon a plan upon a plan. Um, you can also think of, of morphogenesis as going from a local condition to a global condition, right? So my body consists uh, of, of 10 to the power of 23 number of cells, like almost an infinity of cells. But let's say I am a global condition of very local interactions of these cells, right? So growth is something essential to, to develop scalable uh, encodings. So what is, oh sorry, I'm moving a little bit too quick. So some of the elements in morphogenesis toolbox are growth, uh, diffusion, reaction, cell signaling, intracellular communication, and uh, cells can change their uh, internal state. So you can change a, a, a cell from one type to another type. So in, for instance, topological optimization is always performed in a uniform, uh, ho uh, homogeneous material, right? You compute it in concrete or in steel or in wood or whatever. So, but let's say these sort of processes allow also, let's say, to design such construction in heterogeneous materials, right? Which would be far more, far more creative, I think. So the models that I'm, I'm, I'm looking at in, in, in my, my thesis are, um, look a lot like this, right? So, so this is one of the shared obsessions of um, of morphogenesis, the, the, it's called the, the French flag problem. So you try to evolve a French flag from really uh, uh, starting from a, from a singular cell. The interesting thing is that 
hopefully I, I, I will be able to touch upon that later, but growth has lots of interesting capacities for architecture, right? For, for building, if you will. And something that I'm, I'm fascinating with is in, this, in these processes, right? These processes of growth, if you will, not in a metaphorical sense, but quite in a literal sense, what we are able to achieve is, is an idea that I'm trying to develop, which I call uh, implicit fabrication, right? So all these wonderful ro robots, all these wonderful CNC tools that are at our disposal allow us to reach really high levels of complexity, right? But what is lacking in many of these projects is, let's say, a motivation. Why is it so complex, right? Does it need, has to be so very complex? Okay, let me try to develop that idea a bit, bit later. So this is, um, this is for instance, um, an encoding developed by, by Alexandre de Ver, with, with whom we, we've been working, um, that you, you can clearly see that, that it uses mod modularity in its encoding, right? So, for instance, at the bottom, you see here, the first snap operation uh, calls the, the object brick. The second snap operation calls the outcome of the first snap operation. Can you, can you see that in the, in the structure? That you see these four elements, right? And then you see these four elements repeated. So all those elements are snapped together in a, in a modular form, right? We see four groups of these elements that are, that are snapped together. So rather than refinding, uh, re-evolving those rules again and again and again, you are able to, let's say, condense this, this knowledge. So this is, a, this is a, a quite an interesting way of, of doing it. <coughs> However, let's say, I think the way I see it, the, the most advanced encodings have been developed by uh, or Yogev. So in a sense, you have a, a grammar, right? A number of uh, operations that you can perform on a cell. It can split, it can grow, it can grow anisotropically, it can rotate, it can move a little bit. A couple of simple operations, right? So words are forms of these operations. For instance, R1, repeat one, uh, Z can be a word boundary, C10, I can cause a cell to grow isotropically by 10% based on the uh, morphogen concentration that was measured in this cell. So from very simple operations, quite complex operations can be formed. And what's very, what's quite exciting about this is that there are also conditionals, right? So if a cell is sensing its, its environment, it can sense whether there's a lot of pressure coming, right? If there's really a lot of pressure from my neighboring cell on top, I should split in maybe in that direction or in that direction. But what's interesting about these rules is that they're almost human readable, right? So it condenses a form of knowledge. You see what I mean? If, if you, you can read this conditional form as, uh, let's say, as, a, as an entity of, of knowledge, if you will. Maybe, maybe a bit optimistic idea. So an idea that I'm trying to, to formulate is the idea of implicit fabrication. And I, I must say, I, I was really inspired by, by your um, lecture at the, um, at the Fabricate conference. Let's say the, the work that you evoked at the, uh, that Marta evoked at this, this conference, there was, no, there was no distinction between design and fabrication. It's one and the same thing. And that is the direction architects have to develop. And the reason why is that, you know, Philip Johnson said that architects are a whore. And <laughs> he was totally naive. The, 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 the situation is much, much worse. You know, some of your, your, your colleagues are, are being encouraged by some, some tutors to enroll in competitions for which they are not paid, right? They are evenly, evenly, evenly uh, I get all worked up. 
they're even <laughs> less respectable architects among us that are even willing to pay to participate in a, in a competition. So it's like getting a blowjob and asking the whore 50 euros, right? It's, it's the, the situation is much, much worse than, than Johnson projected. So it's way better if you focus the, the work that, that you guys are doing here and what Marta is, is, um, is putting forward here is a very responsible way of, of introducing, of, of teaching you architecture. Because by way of this, let's say, processes of implicit fabrication, you are able to take up a central role in the building process and not get exploit, uh, exploited like some crack whore. Uh, so that's really impressive work by Mark. By <laughs> I mean it. Um, so what is implicit fabrication? So, sorry if I'm a little rude. I'm, I'm Dutch. It's, it's, it's in our genome. Um, so this is Ariel Schlesinger's gas loop. And what I find evocative, and what I, th what I think is part of this idea of implicit fabrication is that it's self-referential, right? You can ask, your, I, uh, ask yourself whether the tool has become part of the artifact, uh, a part of the artwork, you know? Where does it stop being a tool? Where does it become a piece of art? You tell me, right? It's, there's no distinction. Right? So it's sort of symbolic for, uh, uh, let's say, the, the way I think we should develop um, architecture. So perhaps another, another example is this one-ton prop of R Richard Serra. It's, again, it's a self-referential structure. You can think of each of these components of this structure, of this assembly, as a tool that forms this assembly. It's, it's, it's self-referential in this sense. Is it a tool or is it an artifact? It's, it's one, and the, one and the same thing. And I think architecture is slowly creeping towards that, that, that understanding. Uh, so this lamp is, um, I hate ditch design, but this one I find quite, quite fun. Also because of this sort of uh, self-referential nature is that is this a tool is, is this it's is this the the work of art the design so this is this is a knitting machine right is it the knitting machine or is it a design object it's 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 really vague and I'm I'm quite interested in that and let's say the reason why I'm interested in in these images let me try to to, to explain that. Um, in, in, his, in his thesis, evolutionary fabrication, the co-evolution of form and formation, John Riefeld tries to evocate the idea of evolutionary fabrication. So evolutionary design has been used to automati automatically generate a wide variety of novel and creative objects such as circuits, robots, uh, satellite antenna, and yet despite the availability of sophisticated rapid prototyping machines capable of printing uh, objects out of plastic, metal, even circuitry, relatively few of, of these evolved designs have been physically manufactured in the, in the, in the real world. So John Rifo argues that the cause of, of this posit paucity of physical artifacts lies in the design first, build later philosophy in, uh, in, in, in contemporary design. By only specifying the form of an object, this approach leaves unanswered the vital question of formation. As evolved forms become more complex, their formation becomes increasingly difficult for both humans and computers to discover. As a consequence, there is a growing uh, fabrication gap between the complexity of, of objects which we can involve and those which we can manufacture. The alternative proposed here is to use artificial ontogenies. It's a, it's a very 
Corvetic ID almost, no? artificial autogenies, a computational method inspired by the bi biological processes of growth in order to directly evolve the formation of objects. We introduce evolutionary fabrication, the direct uh, evolution of assembly instructions within a simulated manufacturing system and show that this approach is capable of injecting the novelty and creativity associated with evolution, evolutionary approaches into the realm of fabrication, generating not just novel objects, but novel means of assembling those objects just as well. So I'm not so coherent by myself. This is a, a, a quotation uh, of, the, uh, of, of John Riefel's PhD thesis. So, that's, that's quite an interesting idea, right? So then you see these images and you think like, what the hell? Um, you know, it's, it doesn't look as imposing as sort of this, this concept he's evoking, right? But you have to, you have to learn to, to read these images a bit. So let's say the gray areas in these, in these assemble, assemblies are, are scaffolds. So they're temporary structures, right? That do not participate in the, in the final, uh, final artifact. So they're... Uh, uh, yeah, the fabrication is sort of implicit here. Uh, the objective of this evolution is to create as much shadow as possible, right? So that's not very sophisticated. It's just from the z-axis, right? Shadow. So if you look at at the the sequence just above my head, right, you can see that in fact this assembly is highly sophisticated, right? And it's exploiting the dynamics of very few components to arrive at, uh, at a, a great, great shadow zone, right? You see at the, at, the, at the last image. So let's say the logic of assembly, the logic of fabrication is completely implicit into the evolutionary design. So what's, let's say, this is quite a radical idea, I think. So on one hand, evolution allows you, let's say, to arrive at a motivated complexity, right? But I think the coming five, maybe ten years, hopefully we'll be able to work uh, towards a form of evolutionary computing. And my, my thesis will be a very slim uh, contribution to that, hopefully to a design process where you arrived at this, not only at this, let's say, motivated complexity, for lack of a better word, but I was, I was winding on and on and on about growth, right? And why is growth so interesting? Let's say, if you want to assemble a, let's say, assemble a design by, by discrete elements the size of a now let me formulate it a little bit differently. Imagine that, you, that you'd like to as, uh, assemble a column, right? Which, which would be boring if you don't have parsimony. So you have limited amount of bricks in sort of Camaggio uh, uh, color speed, a, a limited amount of bricks that you can use, right? So if we can consider your, your column optimal in terms of structure, you will need to do a lot of scaffolding, right? This structure needs to, will, will need to become porose, right? So why is growth so interesting, right? Because let's say this scaffolding is a logical consequence of the process of growth. So to, today I met two, two fun and really clever students who are working on this idea of a you're working on uh, the assembly of, of uh, uh, broken, broken bricks, right? Wh wh what was the name of the project again? Um, I know it. Brick? Re yeah. Ca again, please, louder. Ah, yeah, yeah. And why am I thinking about that? Sorry, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> but let's say, that's a little painful. So um, I was speaking about why growth is a necessary component to arrive, let's say, at complexity and sophistication in terms of assembly, right? So in growth, this 
this notion of scaffolding of these many temporary positions to arrive at a sort of motivated, perose, structurally optimized uh, column, is, it's all there. It's implicit. <sighs> I'm, I'm really fascinated and worked up about this, uh, this idea. I want to work on it for another 10 years. So another aspect of, of implicit fabrication is perhaps this, right? So this process is some, something you should be, you're probably familiar with by now, right? So we write some script to generate some geometry, then we load our geometry in uh, whatever Mastercam, whatever you use. So we use Mastercam to generate G-code, right? So this G-code is then interpreted by a controller. <sighs> you know, it's a highly ineffective process, right? So if we look, if we look a bit to, to, let's say, more advanced industry like agriculture, we realize that a robot offers great potential in terms of fabrication. So the main reason, and guys, this is largely unexplored, is that a robot is too incomplete. It can send signals and it can receive signals and it can act upon those signals, right? It can, it can sense its movement. If I'm exercising too much pressure, probably I should be doing something else, right? That's a robot can, can, can react. It's, it's turning, turning complete. So an example of this is a harvesting robot, as you, as you see depicted here, locating the fruits to be, to be picked by, by computer vision. So how can this Turing completeness be exploited in fabrication? An example is that an assembly sequence can emerge by perception of markers in the assembly. So by assembling elements, a blueprint unfolds laying out how to further develop the assembly, right? It, it generates further instructions. In biology, this mechanism has been coined stigmergy by the French uh, biologist Grasset in 59. Uh, and it, tended, it, it intended to mean the evocation of work by work. Which, which is ex exactly what is going on, right? You assemble a couple of pieces. By computer vision, you see new markers. Work is evocated by work. And this concept is, is called stigmergy. The idea is that agents modify the environment, for, for instance, by depositing uh, in the case of termites, for instance, by depositing f uh, pheromones or, or building materials. Other agents encounter those environment environmental modifications and take other actions in response. The st stigmergy describes a way of storing information in the environment. It's a beautiful idea, no? Uh, and uses it as uh, a means of indirect communication. So in fact, described like that stigmergy uh, resembles uh, a Turing machine, such that uh, in fact unfolding this assembly uh, can be thought of, of the act of, of computing. So let's talk about self-assembly. Um, Perhaps uh, some of you are, are familiar by, uh, by the... Well, that was a little fast. Is it moving? Yeah, good. So Skylar, Skylar Tibbetts, for instance, has been working on a number of interesting projects that apply the principles of self-assembly. And I think it's a very interesting uh, direction to de develop. In terms of fabrication, we are approaching the situation that um, the, 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 the complexity of art artifacts is no longer limited by the machinery or even the programming involved, but rather the limitations of material organization, assembly, and um, um, the, the, the capacities of the machine operator, those, those become, uh, in, uh, those, those arises become within sight. Not just those tolerances, geometric complexity and complexion uh, construction sequence are, are limiting factors in, in terms of, of, of 
com uh, complexity. So an interesting aspect of, of self-assembly is that rather than having an overview of the global assembly, of having the global building plan, uh, only local information is required to continue the assembly. And remember how the, how, how uh, evolutionary, how, let's say, the, the recent developments in evolutionary computing also underscore the impo importance of local information, right? You develop a set of local rules of a cell, much like a cellular automata, in, uh, in fact. And self-assembly also sort of uh, overlaps right there. Um, so Skylar also developed a number of ideas on how to deal uh, about error propagation, right? I mean, you always, there will always be machining tolerances, so if you want to create an infinite line, he takes that as an example, you need to be able to, to, uh, to error, to, yeah, to, to correct those, those errors. So it's, it's, he has some TED talks uh, which, are, which are quite worthwhile. So remember that, that, remember this image of these artifacts that are, that are growing, not in a metaphorical, in a literal sense. And perhaps we are, we are, we are able to, to, to find such a synthesis, right? We can deduce this, uh, 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 assembly plan. This assembly plan has overlaps with with self-assembly strat strategies, and the whole point of all this work is to arrive at the point of a motivated complexity, right? Where the complexity of the structure embeds a form of intelligence, a, a precision. As in, you, do you remember the, some of the older pe pe people in the audience, like like me and uh, Louise? Uh, oh, no, no, not really, sorry. Uh, I cannot say Marta, but... <laughs> sorry. I, I, but we remember Greg Lynn, for instance, right? Perhaps you younger guys don't. Um, and he did... One of the best projects he did is, is this Alessi vase. And it's a gorgeous vase that was uh, built out of... Out of, out of uh, Titanium, uh, titanium, uh, hot evaporated titanium was exploded in a mold buff such that the material would be uniformly distributed uh, to the mold, really like the, the, the highest state in, in manufacturing. And then it was anodized in a sort of gradient by slowly extracting. Beautiful piece. But what's wrong about it is that it's sort of this burlesque of biological form and it's not made of, out of cellulose tissue, right? So. It's pretty, yeah, I'm, I'm sort of worked up about it. So that's what I mean by motivated comp uh, uh, complexity, right? In nature, things are what they are. There is no interpretation, there is no connotation. Um, so probably by now you think Yella is a total uh, fantast. Uh, so I'm trying to find some proof to. <laughs> Uh, to say that that's absolutely not, not, not true. Not in 10 years anymore, anyway, or five. So this is sort of uh, robotics in, in, uh, in warehouses, right? Yeah, let me, let me take a little pause. It's, it's fun to watch now. Hmm. Was that the same movie? Anyway, okay, you get it, right? So, I, kn I know you're in a bit of a difficult situation uh, economically, me too, but um, here's a fun thought. Let's say a blue collar, co -collar worker um, let's say cost 50, 60 euros an hour, whatever, right? A ro uh, an operational robot, all of the cost to run a robot per hour is uh, roughly five euros. And it's, you know, it's decreasing rapidly, right? This is, you pay everybody, uh, you, uh, the, the robot implementers a big fee to, to run it, you buy new robots, so five euros an hour. 
and it runs 24/7, right? So <laughs> you can you can have 12 robots running one hour for for the same cost as sort of classic blue collar worker. Um, maybe that's a little bit of a depressing thought, but perhaps it you know it reminds me of the the situation in the late late 80s, early 90s, where where they would say um, that that we would live in, in in a world in a paperless world, right? And you all know that didn't happen, right? It it only paper uses only uh, increased. So so perhaps that's a frightening uh, per perspective for for hardworking blue collar workers amongst us. But perhaps I, I can offer a little bit of, of positive out outlook. If if all this amorphous computing uh, works out what it kills is 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 management right <laughs> so i'm i'm more pessimistic for the bureaucratic management than for the for the blue collar workers if, if you will so at some point i went shopping for bots for robots right so this is the uh, the opal factory that shut down in the uh, and the beginning of the of the year, so I called up. You know, there's a couple of stages that the process goes through, right? So there's the the first stages, the the automotive industry visits, right? So evidently, I call the guy and say, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm joining you to to buy the factory. So it's sort of the closest thing I've ever been to to a Blade Runner situation. So, um, for instance, this this welding tour. It's that big. <laughs> it's yeah, it's it's beautiful. So let's say these are all robot controllers, right? So these are computers, and I mean I mean really mean computer in the sense of uh, a personal computer. It's completely too incomplete. Let's just say that if you're able to provide programming for all these robots controllers, then surely the last thing you need to worry about is the acquisition of these robots themselves. They are absolutely dirt cheap. Um, so probably you, you heard uh, this, this news of Foxconn replacing uh, work, uh, workers by a million uh, robots in, in, in three years. So Finally, I, I would like to, to end this lecture by introducing you to the, to the, to the work of uh, Daniel Lobo, who, who's in fact, a, I think he's either a researcher in Madrid or in Barcelona, I, I forgot, and, and Hot Lipson, who's also a student of um, Jordan Pollack. This work is called uh, Reconfiguration Algorithms for uh, Robotically Manipulated Structures. So what you see, um, for instance, in this structure here, is that it tries to evolve the structure to, to go up, right? To form a column or a tower, if you will. And it uses the, the idea of metabolism, right? Redistributing energy. But what I, what I find quite fascinating is that it achieve in, achieves this sort of uh, synthesis between tool and artifact, right? So here you see a robot that is able to traverse through these uh, tetrahedron structures, right? It's, it's especially designed for that. So in fact, by, by those sort of uh, forms of construction, uh, a building effectively becomes, becomes a, 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 a robot. Um, okay, that's it. <laughs> So, so I hope that some of these these aspects here, sort of, are uh, well, maybe two or three of them have settled a little bit better in your uh, in your brain. So, thanks uh, thanks for your attention. And I don't know. Do do we have a a, a couple of questions or discussion? Uh, you thought I was going to talk about uh, hot wire fabrication. Huh? Yeah, I guess. I tried so hard, Marta. <laughs> to be no, <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. Um, 
Ja. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, let's say. Just a second. Let me let me dig up a, a bit of material here. I think all of these, did, did it make sense? Did you catch things from time to time? I, I had the feeling that I was catching things from time to time. So it will give me a lot to think about your lecture. But in, in relation to, uh, to you guys, um, maybe I can offer a little bit of uh, explanation eventually. Um, what you're doing at the moment in the digital fabrication class uh, is basically you're designing something and you're sending it to a machine, right? But the machine is not thinking for you. The machine is not doing anything. There is no intelligence at the level of the fabrication. So all the intelligence is first. And once things are getting fabricated, there is nothing that you can learn from it. <coughs> the moment that you begin to in introduce sensors and introduce a kind of more intelligent, responsive uh, machines, the machines are as important as what you had designed at the beginning because they will begin to change it and they will begin to affect the design. So we will get into this on term two and term three for sure. So I guess that in some time you will remember Yele's lecture and many things will come back to you. Thanks. So, so th these are some of the, uh, the images of uh, a project we've been doing um, about a year ago on, uh, on hot wire cutting. So <coughs> what, what sort of frustrated me in the, in the traditional approaches of, of, um, um, of pr producing molds or elements is that milling is so incredibly dog slow. And you know, it will, there's also, it's, it's a bit useless to, to, to further develop it because it will never, 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 never work. Uh, in, in the, I mean, it's in, the, in fully realizing the, the architectural potential, right? So if you think of, okay, let me try to be a bit more scientific about this. So if you think of, of a, a, a state-of-the-art facility such as Netcom in, uh, in the Netherlands, you find milling, machine, uh, milling machines that are able to scale up to architectural pr proportions. So let's think about how the speed of production of a hot wire machine compares to a large, really high-end, top-of-the-range uh, milling facility. So material removal depth is, let's say, let's be very optimistic and huge, use a huge, huge drilling bit, right? So no precision whatsoever. That's, uh, the, the depth that it can go through is roughly 80 millimeters, right? So a, a normal pretty big tooling radius would be 50 millimeter, right? Diameter of three centimeter, that's, that's pretty coarse. So <coughs> it moves about 10 meters a minute, right? You know, that, that meals away, uh, uh, what is this? Theoretically, it, it mills about uh, three quarters of a cubic meter an hour, right? But that's absolutely theoretical because, of course, half of the time the machine is, is moving through air or repositioning, or right, or uh, maybe you have to change the <coughs> the object you're working on, change its orientation, or flip the flip the boat, or so. Practically, your your the the material you're carving away is a third, maybe, of uh, maybe a third of a cubic meter an hour. It's, it's really, it's really not that much, and only marginal improvements uh, are to be accepted, uh, expected, right? So, the the cost of 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 the hot wired cells that that we developed was um, a fifth of that 
of, of milling the cells. And we used to think, yeah, really not a state of the art of the machine, right? So the software, the software for milling is unbelievably sophisticated, right? It's, it's really, really high end. And for hot wire cutting, it's super, super primitive, right? So even with all those, those uh, disadvantages with, let's say, a, a homegrown hot wire cutting machine with homegrown software, you, you still are able to be super competitive in terms of, you know, this mis milling facility that, that costs millions and millions of, of euros. And, <clears throat> you know, uh, a hot wire machine that, that yeah, you can, you, can, you, can, you can engineer it yourself pretty, pretty easily, right? So th these are uh, specialized uh, milling machines for the maritime uh, industry. But let's say our, our super simple, ultra low-tech hot wire cutter, in terms of architecture, I think, fulfills more, more potential, right? Because let's say if you, if you cut through a, a block of material, you formed, you know, uh, a cubic meter of, uh, in a trivial sense, all bite, but you formed a block of material of a, yeah, maybe a cubic, a cubic meter in 30 seconds or something. So let's say it's an incredibly uh, simple way of, of manufacturing, but it's something that scales. And the other thing is that what, I, what I'm quite fond of with, uh, with EPS is that it has, it has pretty good potential uh, as, a, as a building material, right? So it costs about 36 euros a cubic meter. <coughs> Doesn't cost anything. And it has far better, let's say, isolation properties, insulation properties than, uh, than concrete. And so, something that I'm, I'm working on now with uh, Wes McGee and, uh, and Dave Pegram is that we're, we're, um, we're doing a workshop in two weeks from now. And something that that, that um, an idea that, that, that we've developed, uh, we share this sort of fascination of building with foam and, and, um, and robotic hot wire, hot wire cutting. I, I wouldn't recommend you to, to build a, a custom machine for it. It's a bit pointless if you have a KUKA robot. No, it's, why do that? Um, but the, the interesting idea is that, let's say you can, um, you can really think about interesting processes of how you use, let's say, how you levitate from void to solid. So for instance, if you think of half timber structures, right? Are you, are you familiar with half timber structures? So you have a sort of a timber scaffold and you throw some um, straw, what is it, straw? And there's a, a clay, you, you fill in the holes with, with that basically, and sort of, I'm, I'm quite into keen in exploring these sort of half EPS structures, where part of the EPS is used as a as a scaf scaffold for let's say for uh, uh, for let's say making these channels into which you can pour the concrete. Some of the of the EPS would be lost, and and you would recycle it just to support the structure. Some of the EPS you would you would um, keep it into the structure since it provides excellent uh, insulation, right? So in a sense, those, in a, if you think of a, a, a classical half timber structure, you have sort of the black, tarred uh, wooden structures. Those, those would become concrete, if you will, and those sort of white structures would, would become EPS. It would be a yeah, pretty effective way of, uh, of building. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, so here we're doing the tooling paths. Oh, another fun aspect about hot wire cutting is that let's say if you're if you're doing um, if you, if you're doing these things by milling, and you if you want to transport them to the building site, you have to you have to again mill your packaging material, right? So it's slow, but it's also frustrating because you have to do more milling again. So this was sort of an unforeseen advantage: is that after you do your cutting. Yeah, you just take off the block, dump it on your truck, and <laughs> you're good to go. So let's say this, yeah, there's really little waste in a sense in the, in the, in the whole process. 
Um, and I mean, everybody in architecture loves this white on white stuff, right? It's, it's, it's just beautiful like that. So these are more some more technical matters, right? But now, yeah, now it's old for me. I don't know. <laughs> All right. Thanks for your attention. <laughs> <laughs>